Hello, and thank you for joining us here on The Neutral Zone. I am Phil Milani, joined, as always, by my trusty sidekick, my partner in crime, really. The best way to describe this person is my everything. It's at Eric Delala. Phil, it just didn't feel right without that here at Breckenridge Brewery's Farmhouse in Littleton. Off of Santa Fe. That's correct. Yeah. But without that greeting, it didn't feel quite right. The last couple of weeks uh, that we've been uh, live here at uh, the brewery, I felt maybe like I shouldn't go too silly. But you know what? Uh, the NZ Nation deserves silly, and so now we're bringing that to them. We're going to lean into it, I think. I'm not embarrassed. No, Eric. you shouldn't be. Yeah. So we are uh, broadcasting live at Breckenridge Brewery's Farmhouse in Littleton off of Santa Fe. We've got our audio issues corrected. Eric, Ben Swanson spent all week here working on it. Roya Burton. Those are our two podcast supervisors. Uh, spent the whole week here working on it. We've got those issues cleared up, and uh, we should be sounding crystal clear here at the brewery. And we're also live on the Broncos YouTube page, so we're we're crystal clear. So be careful what you say, Eric. How's my focus, Phil? Yeah, your focus is good. Don't look off over in the, the distance. I know that you want to. I know you want to look at your phone, but you got to pay attention to what I'm saying. There's just so much news going on, but I'll, I'll pay attention, Phil. Thank you I've very much. i got a couple much. notes here. Hopefully it's okay. okay if I look down at those. Yes. The big thing is that this should be an interactive show. So if you're joining us here on YouTube, please leave a question, a comment. Uh, maybe you don't like Eric's hair. Maybe you don't like his voice. Maybe you don't like the sweater he's wearing. Oh, my Anything goodness. Anything that you want to comment on. Maybe some Broncos questions, whatever you're thinking. Just leave them right down there in uh, in the comment section, and then we'll answer them. Could be nice, Phil. Yeah, because you're you're sort of technically an expert. Yeah. Technically, I don't like to brag or anything. You bring the facts, I bring the emotional side, and together we make the neutral zone. Well, Phil, after a 3-0 and start, plenty of facts, plenty of emotion, a lot of so, good stuff to go around. Eric, some people say the Broncos' 3-0 and start doesn't really count because of the teams they played. Ooh. The, the, the Giants, the Jags, and the Jets are combined 0-9. and The Broncos' 3-0, and but it's still 3-0, and Eric. Still, I mean, what do you want them to do, lose those games? Well, the thing to me is that the last couple of seasons, not the best for the Broncos, right? No. So the fact that they're 3-0, and you should just be excited about that, right? Well, you want a little bit of a stat here right off the bat? Hit the, me. The Broncos, the last two seasons, Phil, 10-8 and eight against non-playoff teams. So you think you want to make it to the postseason? You've got to rack up the wins against non-playoff teams. They're only 10-8 and eight against those teams. So, yeah, I mean – you, going 3-0 and o is impressive. You've got to take care of business. That's what everybody's been, saying. everybody's been saying. You know, we took care of business. And it's not like they're winning these games by a field goal at the, at the last second. No. Every win's a double-digit win. You just shut out the Jets 26 to nothing. I mean, you're winning these games about impressively as you could. Yeah. Uh, you, you only can play the teams that are in front of you, and the Broncos have taken care of business these first three weeks. But now – um, I guess the competition is going to get a little bit tougher here with the Baltimore Ravens coming to town. Uh, it should be exciting. They're coming off, obviously, an emotional win in Detroit. Uh, Justin Tucker, a 66-yard field goal, bounces right off of the crossbar, and, of course, it falls in. It, that's pretty much the most Lions way to lose a game. Oh, man, that's tough. Tough. I know Matt Boyer. Matt Boyer. He's a Lions fan, grew up in Michigan. and Our podcast uh, supervisor, Roya Burton. Yes. Michi Former Lions employee. Michiganders. Right. Yeah. Uh, upset about Tough, that loss. Really. Yeah, exactly. So they're coming off of an emotional win, coming out to Denver. Should be a great game. You know what, Eric? I was thinking about this earlier today. It's just exciting that there's a big game between the Broncos and an opponent. It's not a game that, like, you actually really could get hyped over. Yeah, I was trying to think, when is the last game that you kind of felt this way that, w that wasn't a season opener? I maybe go back to 2019, Phil, when the Broncos started off, uh, what, 0-4, oh, I think four. they started that season. Yeah. Yeah. And you work your way back to, I think, 2-4. and four. You've got a game against the Chiefs. You're hosting them. It feels like, man, we can really get something going here. And that place was energetic and power field a mile high. Obviously, you don't win that game. But I think going into it, you kind of have the same feeling mm -hmm. here. And this is even a little bit different because you're 3-0. and oh. And you got a chance to um, to stay atop the AFC West. Yeah, I was thinking actually maybe even the year before that when the Broncos, uh, I think they were at 500. They're going out to face the 49ers, you know, and, and the thoughts of maybe put, making a playoff push were realistic at that point. That's probably the last time going into a game that I felt like, all right, there's something actually on the line here. 
Yeah, and that one was more of a, a letdown, really. You were kind of yeah. looking at that as, hey, we got to – that would have been the equivalent of a, if you had lost to the Jets this past weekend. Yeah, exactly. Um, they, they lost the game. But, I mean, going into it, right. you kind of felt like, okay, this Broncos team's figured things out. They're headed in the right direction. And then, obviously, they lost that game, and the rest of the season uh, unfolded as it did. So excited uh, for this game coming up on Sunday. But first, we got to talk about this Jets victory. Absolutely. The Broncos 26 to nothing. A goose egg up on the board. I don't care who you're playing. If it's a shutout, that's impressive. So we'll uh, definitely talk about this Broncos defense a little bit. Yeah, I mean, we should. And to keep this shutout, that's what's most impressive to me. would have been very easy to give up some points there. Eric, uh, last week on the show, on this Monday show, I was talking about how good this Broncos defense is. And people aren't maybe giving them the credit they deserve. And uh, we made some comparisons to that Super Bowl 50 team. We both agreed not quite there yet let's pump the brakes on that but maybe it's closer than a lot of people are are realizing coincidentally the very next game they go out and prove me correct they must have been watching they must have yeah yeah they must have von miller i know he says that he doesn't really read media reports anymore he doesn't watches. watch maybe he watches maybe he watches maybe he listens see he said he doesn't read it anymore maybe he's going to itunes or spotify or stitcher or TuneIn, yeah. and he's listening he's listening to the neutral zone could be yeah he's like the neutral zone that's a fair and honest podcast unbiased i'm gonna go ahead and watch that one and then neutral even yeah neutral yeah yeah but you would think von probably doesn't like the neutral zone because anytime he's in there Ahead of time, that's a penalty, five-yard penalty. That's true. He stays away most of the time. Yeah, usually, yeah. But last week he must have been watching. So we'll talk about the defense. We'll talk about the offense a little bit too. Uh, Teddy Bridgewater, another solid performance. Nothing spectacular, Eric, but what I would say is you never had a doubt about the outcome of the game, and I think a lot of that is just Teddy's presence. Maybe it doesn't show up in the box score, but the fact that he's out there going into it all throughout the game, never a doubt. No, and, and he's just able to make these plays where, you know, you get sacked on first or second down. It's not an issue. He's going to find a way to get those yards back. He's going to get you back in a field goal range, give you another opportunity to drive down the field. He just seems to have this knack about him, Phil, like you just said, yeah. where he just he makes things work for this offense. Hasn't been perfect, but we'll, I, I, we'll talk about this, whether they're ready for next week. I mentioned this on the Broncos postgame show yesterday with Nate Jackson. Plug. Plug. Uh I said, uh, uh, if you're a fantasy owner, maybe mm. it doesn't bother you that Brandon McManus was 4-4 four 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 on field goals. If you you're know? a Brandon McManus fantasy Yeah, that's what I mean. If you're a fantasy owner of Brandon McManus. Oh, got it. You just, yeah. You, maybe you're a Broncos fan. You're like, let's get more touchdowns. But if you're a fantasy owner, Brandon McManus, more field goals. Smart. Good play. It depends on where you're coming from. It's all about perspective, really. Exactly. exactly. Yesterday was a day for kickers all across the NFL. Mason Crosby, my buff. Uh, got the game winner there. Uh, uh, a lot of people talking about Aaron Rodgers in that final drive. How about Mason Crosby? Just trots out there, 50-yarder, boom, no, automatic. Yeah. So, uh, But, yeah, all around the NFL, the Raiders, all, all these teams winning on last-second field goals. Let's give Brandon McManus a little bit of do here. It never came down to a game winner, but the fact four for four, that's what we're talking about. He's been very solid. Sorry to look over there. Ben Swanson, ben Swanson. dropped off some uh, – some, some comments. We'll, we'll answer some comments. Some questions. Yeah. Do you want to get to us? Well, yeah, I was gonna. We're gonna. We're not gonna save the comments. We're gonna just answer them right away. Okay. How's Jerry Judy? Good, I think. I think th I saw him wheeling around. He had like a little uh, one of those. Uh, I don't even. Yeah, a scooter, but it has a uh, like a pad on it so that the leg that's healing is on it. The other leg's pushing him around. I saw him wheeling around the facility a little bit the other day. Um, I think that's probably a good sign that he's just been around, you know. So we hadn't seen him until this point. So the fact that he's back at the facility, a good sign. And uh, what I think the initial report was six weeks. I Eric? think I think so, which would put him so. back. Around that Washington or Halloween, Dallas game. maybe. Yeah, it could I know be nice. Tom Agnetti, who's definitely watching right now, is coming out for the Washington game. Yeah, maybe he'll see Jerry Judy. Could be. That, and with KJ Hamler out, you're going to need him. So yeah. hopefully he gets back sooner rather than later. You don't want to push it though. Okay. That was from it looks like Duddy and his boys. Thanks, the Duddy boys and the boys. Yeah. Uh, let's skip ahead here. Dana wants to know: Do you think the Broncos are the real deal? What should we go for in a new wide receiver? Ooh, you we. We're going to get to a wide receiver thing. That, okay. that is going to be Sorry. a section here where we talk about the injury. Obviously, K.J. Hamler going down, just crushing news. I saw Zach Azani today, and I was just like, 
you've got to be just distraught here because your guys are dropping like flies. He looked visibly upset. I think that's because the emotional connection to the person, K.J. Hamler, you just got to feel for him because, you know, his hamstrings had been a problem, uh, Eric, tight tightness there. That happens to a lot of guys who are like speedsters. Tight hamstrings tend to be a problem. He felt like maybe he had found a resolution for that. And then for this to happen, you just feel bad for him. I mean, he had the ACL while he was at Penn State. Uh, you just feel like, or was it high school? I think it was high school. It was high school. a high school, yeah. I think, high he, school. I think he did not play early at Penn State because, because of, of that. That's right. He was ACL. rehabbing at Penn State, maybe. Yeah. yeah. So you feel bad for him, but we'll get to, we'll have a, we got a couple of names maybe the, that the Broncos could go after. Maybe it's not quite the end of the world as a lot of people are thinking. No, I mean, yeah, that's there's, a there's some solutions. Here. Yeah, there's a, that's a tease in the business. A couple more questions about wide receivers, so we'll we'll skip over those for now. Okay. Bra- Brandon from Iowa wants to know. Brandon, Brock- what's going on? Thank you for joining us. What's going us. on, Brandon? You got a sticker coming, so keep uh, keep an eye on your mailbox. Yeah, you got to going to have to do a pretty good video to match Tom, Tom Agnetti's reaction. We video. should mention we have neutral zone stickers, so if you are interested in a neutral zone sticker, it has Eric's face on it, has my face on it, and it's very valuable. It's very, yeah. It's, it's worth a lot of money. They're each like a different NFT sort of situation. Yeah. I think so, I think they value around 100 bucks each. Yeah, it's something like that. So uh, if you're interested and you want a sticker, just email us. Right. Uh, what is the email address? Neutralzoneshow at gmail.com. You can leave an email there. Leave a mail. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I keep interrupting. Yeah. Uh, Brandon from Iowa wants to know, for the Broncos to succeed against Lamar Jackson, should they focus more on the run threat or the passing threat? Ooh, good question. I think that – can I say both? I don't. Maybe. I would certainly not answer the question. Okay, I'll say passing. I'll say passing. Um, I think that uh, Alexander Johnson is really – his level of play through the first three weeks this season has really skyrocketed, in my opinion. They've used him as a blitzer a lot. He had two sacks the other day against Zach Wilson. Really impressive. Uh, he was blitzing the other day against uh, Trevor Lawrence as well. Both of those guys are pretty athletic. I think you count on Alexander Johnson quite a bit this week to be that spy, be that kind of guy where you're always keeping an eye on on the run game. But you got to worry about Lamar Jackson, the passer, too, in my opinion, because that's how he's really going to kill you. That, I, I don't know if you saw last week, fourth and 19 against the Lions. It was his arm that got converted there, not his legs. That's true. But, uh, but I think the big thing with the Ravens, like these last three teams that the Broncos have played, is you got to make them one-dimensional. That's how yeah. you're going to have the best chance of beating them. So that's taking a lead, not letting them continue with the run game. Uh, Mike Purcell said today, it's almost like a triple option with how many things that they do. So if you can force Lamar just to pass, it's no knock on him as a passer, but that makes it more difficult for any quarterback when you take away the element of the run, especially the way that they do it. So, you know, in an ideal situation, you're able to stuff the run early, build a little bit of a lead, and then have Vaughn and those guys kind of tee off in the fourth quarter, especially if it's a big drive where they've got to – this is not going to be, Phil, in my opinion – a blowout in either direction. This is going to no. be a close game that goes down to the fourth quarter. Teddy Bridgewater, Lamar Jackson, both Louisville guys. Louisville. Not Louisville. No. Uh, the Broncos PA announcer uh, said Louisville when he introduced uh, uh, um, Teddy Bridgewater. I almost said Lamar Jackson there. He didn't do that. No. Uh, Teddy Bridgewater. He said Louisville because Louisville, uh, for people who are watching on YouTube here, uh, a suburb of the Boulder community just outside of Denver, there is an area called Louisville here in Denver. So if you're a local here in Denver, you see spelled the exact same way, Louisville. That's pronounced Louisville. Yes. But where Teddy played college football is Louisville. Lowell. That's Louisville. how you pronounce it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I would say just about uh, Lamar's running ability. Yes. It kind of reminds me of maybe like um, – Travis Kelsey, because when Kelsey sh- shows up, it's like it's like a dagger, you know, like it's like fourth down and fifteen, and then Travis Kelsey makes a big play, yeah. and you're just like, ah, oh, what the what a wor- what the worst timing, you know, that's English. <laughs> yeah, that is English. We're enjoying ourselves it's the here at worst timing. Brewery, Farmhouse in Littleton. That's a wor- no. If you are a listener in the neutral zone, you know I speak like that all the time. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, it's uh, better now. The worst timing with Travis Kelsey. I feel like that's how Lamar uses his legs, where you think that you've got everything covered, 
and at the worst possible time, he's going to do something with his legs, and it just is a dagger. So you're hedging here because before I'm you just said saying, the passing is more dangerous. It's a lethal weapon, but first you've got to focus on stopping the pass. Okay, got it. Uh, Jonta wants to know if the Broncos have ever played Lamar. They have not. They have not. No. So it's kind of a new experience, and I don't believe that Vic Fangio, uh, I think 2018 was Lamar's rookie year. I'm unsure if the Bears played Lamar that year. Yeah, I'm not um, sure. I don't believe they did. I think they played the, the AFC East that season, but um, it will be a new experience for a lot of these Broncos defenders. It's going to be a tough task. Yeah, but they faced mobile quarterbacks in the past. I mean, he is a, a unique. Different deal. Yeah, he's a unique. Uh, it's a unique situation here with uh, trying to defend Lamar here. But he is a mobile quarterback, and they faced mobile quarterbacks in the past. Uh, and you, you got to do the same thing. You've got to contain, try and keep them in the pocket. Don't let them get out, out the edges, and that does hurt the pass rush a little bit, you know, because if Von Miller can't just put his head down and try and turn that corner like he famously does, he's got to be assignment sound. I know that's what you asked today. You asked it's both. about you assi- know, it's, being assignment sound. Lamar is difficult from a physical standpoint to stop because he's so fast. He's shifty. I think Vic Fangio yeah. used that word today. But also just there's so much misdirection. You've got to be sound in your gaps. You can't get out of your lane or they're going to be yeah. gone for – 20, 30 yards, and then really it's up at that point to Justin Simmons, Kareem Jackson to make a tackle to prevent Ooh. a touchdown. So Lamar probably doesn't want to see Kareem. No, but even you know, even if you get at the ball to the running back or you yeah. know, some sort of fullback trickeration, Phil. Trickerations. And it, they're good in the pass game, too. I mean, yeah. you got Hollywood of Brown, you got Mark Andrews, Sammy Watkins. This is a good offense. Mark Andrews is one of the best tight ends in the NFL. Yeah, I mean, definitely. there's they present a, a lot of problems. So. This, uh, this Broncos defense, really impressive through three weeks. Eager to see how they try to defend uh, this, Ravens def- uh, this Ravens offense. Yeah, I think a good thing for the Broncos that will help them defensively is that they've had success doing a lot of different things. And so I don't know that the Ravens can look at the film and kind of pick on the Broncos and say, like, they haven't done a great job blitzing the quarterback. We're going to no, try to make no them bring pressure. So far, they've been about as good as you can ask for. No holes. No holes. Yeah, I mean, uh, the linebacking unit, Josie Jewell goes down, but uh, the way Alexander Johnson has been playing, really elevating that unit, and, you know, the D-line has stopped the run, and then we know about this secondary. Yeah, and Justin Cernat played really well, too, I thought, yeah. in Josie Jewell's absence. You're going to see a much better offense this week. You know, it would have been nice to – you go against the Giants. They did some good things offensively. That, that was a good test, I think. This Jets offense, they beat themselves a lot, but the, the Broncos didn't – and they don't let them get anything going for the most part. Really, yeah. only one drive of any sort of significance. How many points did uh, they had the, zero points? You're a bottom points. line guy. Zero point. I am. Yeah, same. Yeah, you just get down. Vic Fangio brass said that. Taxes. He told me that yesterday. Oh, really? What you, did he you say? You weren't listening to the press conference. I what guess. did he tell you? I said, "Hey, you let up a, a drive week one against the Giants, week two against the Jaguars, week three you shut them down right away. Is that nice to see?" And he said, "Well, how many points did they score week one on that drive?" I, oh, really? I he said, hit you back with a question. I said zero. And he said, well, I'm a oh. bottom line kind of guy. Bottom He's line, Broncos are 3-0. and Kind of testy with you a little bit No, sometimes. I like that. We, yeah. we have a nice little rapport, I think. Okay, yeah. You hit him with the hard ones. Yeah. The fans. <laughs> you know, some other questions like that. Yeah. How how impressive were the fans, though, yesterday? And power field at Maha was rocking. It was rocking. And they're going to need the same thing next week. That'll be yes, they do. a big advantage. I would not feel... Great to be honest. If this matchup, we're at MT and is it MT and T or MNT? I think it's MNT Bank. Well, yes, MNT Bank Stadium. MNT Bank Stadium. I would not feel great about this matchup on the road. Yeah, but when you've got the crowd behind you, the the home field advantage, the elevation, to me, that's enough to to tilt it in Denver's favor. But yeah, but if you go out to Baltimore, you do get the crab cakes. So perfect. Yeah. That'll help tilt the scales. <laughs> like tilt the scale in your hotel room, Phil, so, when you're getting <laughs> a little ready later on. Yeah. Huh? yeah. Wow. What a shot there. Gee. Goodness gracious. Uh okay, so keep the comments coming. We like the we like to answer those types of questions uh here. Uh if you're watching on YouTube, just post a comment right down there. This is an interactive show. Eric, do we have any more to get to? Or uh, they're mainly we wide receivers. We should, okay. we should keep Let's going. Let's hop on in. Let's hop in. We can talk about the wide receivers the intro, right huh? off the bat here. Yeah. That was the whole intro. Let's talk about the wide receivers. Uh, I, I think the initial reports were that maybe K.J. Hamler dodged a bullet. Eric, I went to sleep last night. I, uh, I got all nestled in my bed thinking, okay, 
KJ Hamler is going to be okay. I can sleep tightly. I had uh, happy dreams of a of a 26-0 victory. You know, I was feeling good. But then Vic Fangio walked out up onto the podium today and was just like, "Yeah, KJ Hamler is not going to play again this season." The way he said it too, Eric, it was just like. He won't play again this season. Normally, it's not not like that. It's like, uh, unfortunately, we got the MRI results back, and uh, it, it is this, you know, and then that's how it normally goes. He just goes, he's not playing again this season. And you were sad at that point. It just hit me. I, yeah. I almost fell over. Yeah, that could be your back too. Yeah, that could have been my back. Yeah, yeah. that's true. But no, yeah, it, KJ it, Hamler, that's big, big loss. Eric. Well, and I asked him. I said, hey. KJ Hamler kind of pushes defenses. You like it, to talk about your questions a lot. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, I some of us, at least one of us, has to ask the questions. Phil can't all just point the camera at. Okay, keep going. You keep on. Yeah, I've got a little segment here with the beers, so you might as well keep a little bit yeah. for the end. Okay. Keep um, going. you know, KJ Hamler stretches the field. Are you going to miss him just in that regard? And you said, well, KJ, he gets open a lot. He makes some good catches. He's a good receiver. They're going to miss him more than just his ability to kind of stretch the field. You saw him get open on that big third down play on the Broncos' first touchdown drive. It was, what, I think third and nine. Teddy's got people all around him, crowding him, and he's able to, to get it to K.J. Hamler for, I think, 22 yards, picks it up. So, yeah, they're going to they're gonna miss him, and I thought Tim Patrick made a good point, Phil. You can replace K.J. Hamler, but you're going you're gonna to have to do it differently. You know, you, you're not just going to get a guy that has that God-given speed as he said about KJ, you're going to maybe need to replace his production in different ways. You're not going to find somebody that can just go four, three, five, or whatever, and and take the top off that way. Yeah, I think when you look at his Broncos wide receiving core, you're like, okay, Corlin Sutton, big guy, he can go do the deep ball, but it's a little bit of a different way. Um, Tim Patrick, big wide receiver, he does what he does. They don't, they don't really have a another guy who's like like KJ Hamler in terms of just a speed you can use him uh, you know in a, in an end around you put him in motion you do some misdirection stuff pre snap i think the fact that you know he presents something that they don't really have that's where you're going to miss him and i guess that Deontay Spencer is probably the closest thing that they have in terms of just the physical traits um but uh, there's a reason why K.J. Hamler was uh, a second-round draft pick. And if you look at it, Jerry Judy, the first-round pick from two years ago, gone. K.J. Hamler, gone. Now now you're you're searching around and you're, you're looking for some answers. Yeah, I mean, K.J. is a much better route runner than Deontay. Not, not a knack on Deontay because he a has knack? a Ooh, knack on Deontay even. because he has, uh, he has his kind of specialty area here with, with the pun returns. But K.J. is a crisper route runner. Yes. Probably faster out of his breaks, better getting separation. All, just in terms of being a wide receiver, he's a yeah, more he's polished. more polished exactly yeah. guy. So you can't expect Deontay to fill that role. But I think where where they hurt is that you've lost your two slot guys essentially because Jerry Judy can operate really well from the slot. KJ Hamler can operate really well from the slot. Tim Patrick and Cortland Sutton out there pose their own issues because they're so big. big. Tim said today, "You could cover us perfectly. We can still make the catch just because that's how big we are out there." Tim Patrick, five targets, five catches. Yeah, he doesn't drop the ball. No, Very you throw impressive. it in his, his direction, catches it. So they're going to have to find somebody to, to fill that slot role here over the next few weeks. Or the other option, and somebody asked about this today, they could just go to more two tight end sets and really ride this out in some heavy personnel, run the ball a little bit more, get it to your to Albert O, Noah Fant, um, you know, and, and then get it to Cortland and and Tim Patrick and not kind of worry about that third guy. But there are times when they're going to have to go three wide, Phil, and so a few different options. Someone uh, asked us, Jonathan asked if Demarius Thomas is still in football shape. I don't think that that's probably a realistic option. He's been retired a year now, essentially. Well, um, Ben Swanson and I flew to Atlanta in June. Yeah, That's when he officially announced his retirement, but he's been out of football for a little while. Yeah. I would say that DT is not an option at this no. point. I would say that he has uh, uh, mentally transitioned into a post-football mindset here, and he's moved on from the game. Yeah. Um, another question here from the real Dougie P86 is, is who should they trade for at wide receiver? And so maybe I Phil, think we, we don't think. Well, so the, yeah, maybe we open that up to. Okay. Should the Broncos make a big move like a trade, or do you promote someone internally, or do you find someone? You know, a guy you can sign off the street. What what makes most sense to you? Well, here's why I wouldn't be. 
It hurts losing K.J. Handler, but it's not the end of the world, and here's why I would say that. This Broncos wide receiving court is still very deep, and Jerry Judy has not gone for the whole season. Okay, he's just gone right now. So when he comes back, your starters are still toward the upper end of the NFL, I would say, in terms of uh, Corlin Sutton, Jerry Judy, and Tim Patrick. When, when you've got those guys out there, you still have a lot of playmakers, a lot of weapons. So to me, a trade where you're giving up assets in the future, I, I don't think that that's really something that I would explore. And I know that um, Mohit Lohani sent in a— uh, Looking at uh, your phone, huh? Oh, I got an email here, Eric. Is that a lot? Or? I don't know. I was told not to look at my phone. I did it quickly. I did it yeah. kind of smooth. Okay. I did it. I was sort of smooth about it. You know, I got I a sort of a I suaveness. Yeah, I noticed. Yeah, well, the viewer, I, I'm not sure it did. But, um, I think they did now. Well, you brought yeah, it up. But I think yeah, they did. That was kind of rude of you to bring that <laughs> up. You notice when you were looking off, I kept going. You know, that's a professional. I just, yeah, of course. Uh, I keep going. So, Back to your um, phone. Uh, anyway, uh, Mohi Lohani wants to know, maybe a guy like uh, Golden Tate is out there, and he brought up, hey, hey, it's okay to go after maybe an older guy. One of the examples he brought up is Emmanuel Sanders. Already has two touchdowns this season up in Buffalo. He's in the twilight of his career. Maybe you can find an older guy who – you could plug in, play, and uh, get some production at least for the next couple of weeks. Yeah, it's interesting because you don't want to stunt the development of any of the guys. The young, because Cortland's still pretty young. You know, Tim Patrick is just You're not found, looking for a one. You know, a right? One. Exactly, exactly. And so you got to be. I think you got to be strategic here with what you do because you don't want to take reps away from any of those guys when they're healthy and ready to go. Um, so yeah, maybe a Golden Tate makes sense. Maybe. John Brown, he's a guy that's kind of that fast receiver. He does, I think, there's some reports he has that sickle cell anemia. So maybe a mile high which, would not be great. Well, I think a couple of years ago in 2019 they said it wouldn't stop him from signing with Denver. But, yeah, definitely something to consider because we've seen that impact guys you know, Ryan before. Ryan Clark uh, with the right. Steelers couldn't play here. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think there's a case to be made, Phil, for just, you know, you've got Seth Williams on the practice squad. I believe Tyree Cleveland is still on the practice squad. Um, having Kendall Hinton there, like you can probably ride this out if Jerry Judy truly is going to be back here in what now four or five weeks. Yeah, that's what you I, can I think. Probably get through it without having to make a big veteran addition. Uh, earlier today, uh, somebody asked Vic Fangio, "Hey, who's going to be Lamar Jackson on the scout team this week? You know, for practice, usually a guy." who has similar physical traits, will try to imitate the opposing quarterback. And uh, He said you, right? I was going to volunteer myself. Yeah. I thought maybe, you know, just purely physical, you know, speed, size, athleticism. I thought it was a natural, obvi- sort of obvious, I thought. Yeah. But You're more like a Big Ben, I think. Week, week <laughs> yeah. five, maybe yeah. they'll use you. A week five Big Ben, mm-hmm. or... Oh, yeah, because they played Steelers that week. I thought you meant maybe a later season big man, like already dinged up. Oh, him. no, I mean, yeah. the Broncos are playing the Steelers got it, got it. Yeah, maybe they'll call me then, yeah. But anyway, he said that Kendall Hinton might be that obvious choice, but because of the injuries at wide receiver, Kendall Hinton's too important to be yeah. just running around as a scout team quarterback. He needs to be actually practicing for game reps as a wide receiver. Yeah, he can't be doing that. No, he can't be doing that. So I would... Uh, another name I saw out there was Benny Fowler, the former Broncos uh, wide receiver. He might be an option. I saw somebody mention that. Um, He's been out of the league for a while. If you ask me, though, I think that uh, a guy like Seth Williams showed enough in the preseason to just maybe get a shot here. Uh, I would say that. Or, you know, Eric, you look around at some of the other teams around the NFL. They all have practice squads. Maybe you maybe you look at uh, a guy who's sitting on another team's practice squad. Somebody somebody like that, I think, makes sense to just sort of tide you over until Jerry gets back. And the the, the small issue with Seth Williams or Tyree Cleveland is that the slot. They're yeah, not they're, the they're, really in, that, they're in that Sutton Tim Patrick mode. Yeah. Well, mold, you know, Kendall Hinton has worked on his route running. Yeah, he looks no, a little Hinton bit sharper. Is, is like, the type of guy you want? Yeah, I think maybe you, you need that smaller right. guy, kind of the slot receiver, a little bit quicker. Yeah. They'll find somebody. I think you know George yeah. Payton has shown already he's willing to go poach guys off practice squads, uh, work the waiver wire. So yeah. I would imagine right now they're trying to figure out what's the best uh, plan of attack. Yeah, and they'll uh, they'll have them ready to go. The one thing I would not do is trade any future assets, though. That's not – I don't think that that's an option. Okay. 
yeah, in my mind. So, well, and the, the issue for me is is that if this happened three or four weeks from now, like say you're sitting at, say you're able to split these next four or something like that, and you're or sitting, went all four. Sure. Okay. Well, say you, say you're seven and zero after the Cleveland. Now you're game. talking. Yeah. I like it. Say okay. you're seven yeah. and zero after the Cleveland game, and that's when KJ goes down. You might think, hey, we got something really special on our hands. It's worth Make a it. run. It's worth it to deal a, a third round pick or a fourth round pick for somebody. Get them in here. But right now, three and zero. The teams you've played, what you've been able to see. I don't know that you have enough to kind of say. Like I think you're feeling good and saying, "Hey, we can make a run toward the playoffs." I don't know if you think yet. Hey, we're going to make a run to the Super Bowl. And so yeah. I, to make a, a big move and kind of uh, sacrifice the future, especially as much as we know George Payton likes picks. He said those are darts. That's the foundation. He likes darts. It. Yeah. He's kind of like Ted, da- Ted Lasso. He likes darts. Yeah. I would not give up anything, in my opinion, especially because the, you still have a lot of playmakers. Like, yeah, Albert O happens to be a tight end, but he's just – if you could just gl- lump him into yeah. a category, he's a playmaker. Yeah. He's an option in the passing game. You go two Noah tight ends. Noah Fant. You know, these guys – there's still a lot of weapons out there. And even – we've seen Teddy use the running backs in the passing game. Uh, he hit Melvin Gordon for a 20-plus gain uh, – 20-plus yard gain the other day – or yesterday. So I think that – there's still enough weapons on this team where you don't need to go out and do something significant. And uh, who knows, every week now it seems like a, a key injury happens. So maybe there's another position where you don't have as many playmakers uh, at that spot that you might have to do something like that. So. Here's something else I would not do. This was brought up inside the Broncos' web office today. The web. A collaborative place. The ball. The bullpen. Bullpen. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, would you trade – Assuming there's been some reports that Ronald Darby will be back for the Pittsburgh game, apparently according to him, that's a, I've seen that. It's apparently I, saw, a good I think Mike Kliss bumped into to Darby and said he? that he was going to be ready. Yeah, I think that's who reported it. That's he just it. bumped into him. I that's don't know how he does. Convenient. It. Yeah, that's why he's the he's best. He's an R. Yeah, um, I would not trade a cornerback no. for a wide receiver. Wouldn't do it. I, I think one thing we've seen throughout the first couple of weeks in the NFL, cornerbacks are a, a, a valuable commodity. You know, they're, and they're harder scarce to find. resources. Yeah. You know, what what would be like? It would be like stumbling upon some gold. Out, you're maybe you're out in the Colorado wilderness enjoying some fall foliage, and you stumble upon some gold. That would be like finding a cornerback. That could be nice. Could be nice. So rare. Uh, I think that where. Is that what you said? You said that would be rare. Rare, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was going to say maybe Guanella Pass is a nice place to see some some fall foliage. Aspen, you could go up into the into the mountains a little bit. Kind of the color of this. Uh, yeah, amber. Yeah, yeah nice, nice amber there color. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, that's what I think that what the Broncos might might do here at the wide receiver position. Um, we should mention that we're broadcasting live here on the Broncos YouTube page, and we are at Breck Brewery's Farmhouse. Out in Littleton, right off of Santa Fe. We try to make it a farm home. Trying to make That's the farmhouse a farm what, home. Yeah. Uh, we're here every Monday from 6 to 7 celebrating Broncos victories. And... That's all we're going to yeah. do all season. Cause exactly. We're on a roll. It's yeah, exactly. Ben Swanson, podcast supervisor. We keep getting some questions here. Yeah, let's hear Ooh, them. Brandon from Iowa wants to know what are the beverages of choice this evening? Um, I think that this is um, some sort of a juicy IPA. Yeah, that's nice. It's still summer. Today it was 90 degrees here in Denver. It's getting a little chilly now. A little bit chilly, but nice you know, you still want like a nice summery IPA is what I would yeah. say. Yeah. That's what I went for. Well, you already knocked back most of this case over here. Fifteen cans. I'm not sure how many are Broncos left in there. Country Hoppy Pale Ale. I said, I said, uh, hey, let's have some out on the display. I put these out, and then you drank the rest of them. That's why only the box is there. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Here's a good question. If they were to name a drink after Phil, what would it be called and what would be in it? I'll go first. Vodka on the rocks named Forget About It. Tom Magnetti. Tom Magnetti. Tom you jog, you. <laughs> Tom is at Neutral Zone Nations. He's in the running for the number one fan. He right is. Now. He's right That's up there. That's what I would say. Jeff He's coming Flanagan's out to the been Los- a little quiet. Jeff Flanagan's been quiet. Brandon from Iowa, it's good to He's hear from there. you. AJ, AJ, number one Teddy fan. Lol. We, we were thinking, of, we were talking about this, Phil. 
maybe we would do a bracket of the best neutral zone nation fans, have them compete against each other. People could vote. You want them to turn against each other? No, no, just friendly. Well, if we we listen to some of these voicemails, Tom was like, I got to get my voicemail in quick before AJ can get his in there. So they're already (laughs) turning. Okay. No, uh, what's your answer here? Maybe a Breckenridge bourbon is what I What would you call it? More of a bourbon, maybe, I don't know, tall boy. Yeah, There's tall boy. A tall boy. Like yeah. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? It's pretty good. Yeah. I'm definitely a double on the rocks. You know, yeah. something like that. I would do you I you make a say. nice uh, gin and tonic? I do make a nice gin and yeah, tonic. So yeah, so I would do that and I I would just call it the malicious. Malicious. Yeah, it gets yeah. after you a little kind bit. Kind of like Milani but also malicious. Yeah, the kind malicious. Of, kind of malicious. Yeah. You like that I like word. That. I do like that word, yeah. Yeah. That is a favorite word of mine. Tall boy is what I Tall guy? Tall guy. Sometimes George Payton calls me tall tall guy so tom says for the record i turned off peyton and eli for nc nation oh thank Thanks, you tom. that's thank tom, you very that's Tom's love just, that's love he's right uh there. doing his yeah. best to earn that yeah. top spot appreciate it. any so, more questions well here? i do want to i do want to get to this one from jake because we've talked about the wide jake receivers. Hodge? hodge either hedge hedge he's got your last name kind of <laughs> um, we haven't heard from uh, our friend john jornot in a little bit john jornot that's uh, your friend yeah, <laughs> yeah. um because we've talked about the wide receivers, Phil, but do you think the offense as a whole, and this kind of gets to Jake's question is, is Denver creative enough on offense? Is it too simple? But I, I want to expand that to, is this offense ready to play? You know, the Jets had a good defense. Giants have some good players on defense. But when you're in these close games, you're going to have to score a little bit more. They haven't broken 30 yet. You can't have field goals. You can't be settling for um, – you can't fumble sure. in the red zone. So is this Broncos offense ready? And maybe you can touch on the play calling. You can touch on some of the execution. But are, are they ready to go? Okay. Uh, here's uh, here's my answer to that question. Pat Shermer was uh, mean in the media last week. He does. Yep. And he said that in every situation, the Broncos are trying to execute what their goal is for that specific situation. So, like, for example, the end of the Jags game. They took a knee instead of trying to score a touchdown. Yep. He's like, that's what the situation called for, right? So the Broncos game pretty much well in hand against the Jets. It's 26 nothing, the final score, right? They could have scored a touchdown, but Javante fumbled there near the red zone. So maybe you're maybe you're cracking 30 that way. But my, my answer to the question is they're calling plays for this specific situation. So... Three opponents here the Broncos have faced. They're all 0-9. Maybe the situation so far this season hasn't called for anything particularly creative. You don't want to you don't want to go out there and just open your bag of tricks against the Jets. Oh, do you know what I'm saying? You think there's a bag of tricks? Waiting. Yes, there is a bag of tricks. And I, actually, I was going to say that Pat Shermer's done a tremendous job. I think so far through three weeks, uh, him and Teddy seem to be in sync. They seem to be thinking the same way. They're, you know, they're seeing things uh, out on the field. They're making adjustments. I think that they're they're on the same page. And so far, I've actually been really impressed with the play calling. Yeah, I, I think he's done a nice job. I think part of that is it's year two. He knows a little bit not with Teddy, but he knows how do you use Cortland Sutton? How do you use? Jerry Judy when he's healthy, Tim Patrick, Noah Fant, all those guys. Melvin Gordon, obviously he's learning about Javante Williams, who's been, fumble aside, really, really impressive, as good as advertised. So I like what Pat Shermer's done, and I, I think you haven't heard really, there's no chatter in the press box or after games like, what was that call? You know, or yeah. I, I don't get that. It, he's been putting guys in position to succeed. I think something like that Hamler play on that third down where he's wide open, you're scheming guys open. Um, I do think there's something to what you're saying is that the Broncos haven't really used a, a trick play, a gadget they, they don't need type to. play yet. They have not needed to do that. Um, they will need to, to clean things up in the red zone. They will need to clean things up on third down. They were two for five in the red zone, two for four on goal to go situation. So, I mean, the the kneel down was one thing, but last week you have, a I think, a third and one from the three-yard line. Noah Fant jumps. And instead of a, a touchdown or a first down at the two yard line, now it's third and six. So they got to be cleaner. They got to be think cleaner. That's it. That's you, definitely. You're true. not going to beat Baltimore with field goals, and so yeah. they do have to be better. But some of that is a week to week thing. I think Teddy can still get better. You're still figuring some of this stuff out. So, I mean, uh, Jake followed up here and said, with how flat our offense has seemed, do you think Teddy can carry our team to the playoffs? I don't think it seems flat at all. There's been a spark here. They've been able to convert on some of these third and longs that in the past field they just they'd get behind the chains and you were kind of resigned to the fact that you'd punt 
I've been impressed. I, I think back to that Jacksonville game, third and six or second and sixteen. Teddy's able to get the ball to Javante Williams for a ten yard gain. Then you find Cortland Sutton for a big gain. A few plays later, you're in the end zone. That that doesn't happen last year, I don't think. Yeah, I, I would say maybe the flat that he's talking about is there wasn't like a huge big play. You know that it didn't look like the Chiefs out there where they're just like you know doing all these crazy things down the field. That's fair. Chiefs though have lost two games in a row. I'm not sure if you caught that. I heard that. Yeah, they lost two games in a row. The, I think they're in last place in the AFC West. They are for the first. Yeah. They're not in. They have a losing record for the first time since I think the middle of the 2015 season. Yeah, that's crazy. unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, also, we should uh, take a second here to extend some well wishes to Andy Reid. Hopefully, he's doing okay yes. there. Um, okay. Went to the hospital after the game. Uh, hearing that he's doing okay, though, hoping to rejo- rejoin the team here uh, shortly. So, uh, wanted to say that. But yeah, the Chiefs in last place. But I think that's what he's meaning by flat. Just nothing really too crazy. And uh, I'll say this: I think that Pat Sherman has to think about the game overall, but also like the whole team. And with the way that this defense has been playing, you got to have that in the back of your mind somewhere. And the Broncos heading into last week, the number one team in the NFL in time of possession. They've had long drives, and what that's allowed the defense to do is get recharged on the sidelines. They've been allowed to uh, regroup, get some rest. They haven't had to play that many snaps. And that's a credit to the Broncos' offense. So, like, that doesn't show up in the box score as yardage or points, but... In a way, that is what Pat Shermer and Teddy, and they've been able to get these long drives. That's helped the defense, too. Yeah, I mean, they've been methodical. They've been consistent. That's what I would call it, not boring or flat, consistent. You know, they've been able, they've had these long drives, and it's not flashy, but they have shown that they can do that when they need to. Yeah. So they went down the field quickly against Jacksonville. Um, hopefully, you're able to see a little bit of, of that at times, but the fact of the matter is, Phil, we haven't seen them in situations where they need to do that. Yeah, there's not been like a fourth down where you're like, the game is on the line, they have to execute this play call. What's the call? Can they execute it? We haven't seen that yet. I mean, the closest thing we've seen to that was the two-minute drill against the Giants where it's fourth down and I think two, if I remember correctly. You go for it, you've got like 50 seconds left, and you go down the field and you score a touchdown. And they did just fine in that situation against a good defense at the end of a half. But you're right, we haven't seen them. It's going to take some time before we learn when you're down seven points, when you're down ten points, when you're in the fourth quarter and you need a f- go-ahead field goal, what, is, they, what does it look like in that yeah. situation? We'll find that out at some point, but because they've been so dominant, we don't know no that need yet. To. And, th- and in my mind, that's a good thing. You don't want to be in that situation every week because those 50-50 games, Phil, they tend to be coin flips. Yeah. And so you're going to lose some of those if you're in those every single week. I mean, what, the Broncos in 2015, I think, were like 8-0 in one-possession games, but... That doesn't happen normally. They're, so Yeah, they're going to face a team where the, um, they're going to need their bag of tricks. And right now, you don't want to put that on film. You know, you don't want the Ravens to be able to game plan against something that you... Can you pay attention to me, please? Gosh. Oh, Man, my I'm gosh. sick of this. No, I'm just kidding. You're getting some comments there. Uh, uh, the last uh, co- thing I'll say is just you don't want to put anything out on tape. You don't want the Ravens working on something that the Broncos have been practicing, working on, and saving for a situation like we just talked about. Yeah, and I don't even know that it's like trick plays so, or things no, like that. No, just like different things, that tendencies, anything yeah, like they, that. they just haven't just had to. Just don't put to, anything out there. The Broncos haven't had to do that stuff yet because they haven't been in those situations. The most they've trailed by is four points, I think, and that was, or I guess seven points against the uh, the Jaguars, and that was very brief. Yeah. So they, they haven't been in a consistent situation where they've been behind. At some point it will happen. And they'll figure it out then, but for right now, not an issue. Oh, one other thing I might just mention. Yeah, of course. You know, they like to script those first couple of plays. I thought, you know, uh, the first drive was going okay. It stalled out a little bit, but the second drive to come back and score a touchdown, uh, I thought they got off to a little bit of a better start this week. Yeah, much better. Yeah. Much better. So um, that is, that's another thing, credit to Pat Shermer, Teddy Bridgewater, coming up with those first couple of plays, knowing how they wanted to attack this team. They had success coming in, and that, that speaks to the game planning. A couple of final questions here on the offense. Johnny wants to know, where was Noah in the last game? Ooh. Seemed like he was rarely looked at. He had a couple of catches, uh, also had a couple of penalties. Wasn't Noah's best game. He's got to stay involved. And I, so I think because they were trying to be so committed to the run game, maybe that 
hurts Noah a little bit. You know, and Teddy's going to spread the ball around. It doesn't seem like he's going to go to one guy ten times, twelve times. Um, but you're going to need Noah Fant in these games, so hopefully he's able to have a little bit bigger of an impact. Well, Noah had two catches, is that right? I think so, yeah. And I think that uh, Alberto, I mean, the tight ends were not a big part of this game plan, and that could have just been what was going on this week. And uh, I think that... Jets have a good linebacker in C.J. Yeah, Mosley. I was going to say, maybe that just speaks to the Broncos' depth there at Playmaker, is that, hey, if the Jets want to try and take away, maybe they're doing some things, the tight ends don't have to be a part of the game plan. They can go elsewhere. I'll say this about Noah, just that... When he gets a lot of targets and is a big part of the passing game, he tends to be a little bit more locked in. I'll just say that is that when he when he is making those touchdowns, he's moving the ball down the field. He tends to just be like more solid all across the board. When he's not getting the ball, you start to see some of those things where uh, there's an illegal formation on a, on a big play, got called back. There was a false start. Uh, I think those are part of the maturation process here for Noah Fant, just that, hey, I'm not getting the, the yardage this week, but I'm still a valuable part of this offense. I'm still engaged and uh, cleaning up those penalties because I know that heading into this week, Vic Fangio said w- a big focus was cleaning up uh, some of those penalties. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Noah needs to stay locked in, and he, like I said, he needs to be a major part of this offense for you to – be able to beat some of these top teams. We know how talented he is. When you're in that red zone, it's got to be clean. You yep. can't be, yep. you know, knocking the team like that. So, uh, Dana wants to know what do you think about the rookies and how they're doing. Javante Williams, obviously, a big game. Pat Sertain, or has a late fumble, which is kind of a negative there, but I'm not too worried about that. He got hit by three guys at once, and then are you three, three guys. I mean, it's. Nothing, that's nothing to you. That's nothing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, I I think if you look across the board, the rookies, uh, let's start with Pat Sertan. He had the interception uh, uh, against the Jaguars a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Big pass pretty, breakup this week. It seemed like Zach Wilson was targeting him earlier in the game. You know, looking at that secondary, you're like, okay, we're go- we're going to have to try and test the, the rookie. I thought after giving up a couple maybe early in the game, pretty solid performance there after that. Javante Williams finds the end zone. Uh, had the fumble, and I thought one funny moment from yesterday was after the game, uh, a reporter asked him, hey, are you going to keep that ball? He was talking about the touchdown, and he was like, the fumble? Yeah, of course, I, you know, I got to clean that up. I can't, I can't be giving up the ball. And he's like, no, I'm talking about the touchdown. Are you going to put that in a case or something? I thought that was funny. But then Quinn Miners had to come in, the third-round pick, uh, forced to play there when uh, Dalton Reisner goes down. Uh, both guards down you know everybody talking about the Hamler but Dalton Reiser and Graham Glasgow going down in that game too uh Quinn Miners comes in plays uh, big minutes Caden Stearns had the interception I mean you're seeing a lot of contributions from this rookie class definitely Jonathan Cooper is getting a lot of snaps Baron Browning I am Coop yes Baron Browning came in toward the end they've they've got yeah. some guys contributing um I do want to say with Pat Sertan something imp- that impressed me is he's keeping everything in front of him He's not getting beat deep. You know, yeah. on some of these catches that he gave up, it was a five-yard hitch or a comeback or something like that, and he's he's rallying to the ball. He's making a good tackle. You can live with that if you give up a five-yard or even a ten-yard pass every now and then. The yeah. big ones are what are going to hurt you. So hopefully we see that this week from uh, Pat Sertan again. Pat Sertan a second. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I said it's, it's Pat Sertan again. again. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that's what they – that's what they said on the birth certificate. Like, yeah, what do you want? Again. Yeah. Pass Pass again. again. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question from AA55RP. Ben Swanson's handwriting, and he's just needs he to does, be He tries hard. He's trying. Um, are you all happy with the David Moore signing? Reportedly from the Vegas practice squad, previously with Seattle, 78 receptions, 1,163 yards, 13 touchdowns. 13 uh, touchdowns. I know, yeah. I know he's a veteran with some experience. I don't know much about him, so I'm not going to pretend to weigh in. But uh, that's kind of the direction that we were talking about, Phil, is signing a guy off a practice squad, not um, not sacrificing draft capital. And obviously we don't know what else could happen Is that here. official or no? I, that's why I said reportedly. Oh, you allegedly? That's different. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah. So reportedly. I, I do like, uh, the, I, I like the general direction there. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you got a guy who's going to be able to get you across – you know, to when Jerry Judy is is back, you know, tied you over a couple of games here, but obviously um, not a guy who's like 
oh, I'm the head honcho around here yeah. or something like that. So kind of kind of almost exactly what we were talking about earlier. How about that? Phil, uh, one last question. This one's from me. Before, I think you want to talk about the Ravens a little bit? Yeah, uh, I, might, I should say uh, we got about 10 minutes left in the show here. So, Well, I was going to say, before, before we get to the Ravens real quick, uh-huh. I think a, n- a nice new segment each week could be a little cheers to a player from the previous game that really impressed us since we're here at Breckenridge okay. Brewery Farmhouse Ooh, in Littleton. I like that. You like that? On the spot. We did not talk about this before, no. but we're so seasoned. We're kind of like David Moore. We just go with the flow here. Yeah. David Moore. Okay, I mean, we basically go got 1,100. Well, I thought I'd let you go 13 first. 13 touchdowns. Studio. Yeah. Okay, the player. Who would you? Would I, I think say? hopefully we can do this. I like. We could do, we could do whatever we want. <laughs> yeah. You went to Northwestern? I did, yeah. yeah you could do whatever you want to do. Yeah. You too. Uh, you went to Colorado? I went to Colorado, okay. yeah. Um, all, RIP all my All cheers to, uh, to Tim Patrick. I thought he stepped up really well after K.J. Hamler left. Five targets. Five catches. Five catches. 98 yards. He continues to just... He was asked today, do you think people are eventually going to figure out nope. who you are? And he's like, I don't think so. I'm an undrafted guy, so I don't get any respect. He's probably – he might be my favorite person when he walks up to the podium. He's, you never You're know. just like, you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. If he's, like, in a certain mood and the right – He's like when Ben Swanson right pulls buttons. out an easel. You don't know what is about to happen. Ben Swanson famously loves to uh, paint – uh, so Tim Patrick, can, nice work. Well, I was going to say mostly birds uh, and uh, um, the neighborhood neighborhood drawings. Yeah. You got one? Very, um, I'll, I'll cheers. How about I cheers Caden Stearns? Okay. First interception. Uh, uh, cheers. Yeah. To, 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 can, to you. you got to drink. Otherwise, it's bad luck, Eric. You don't want that. I right? drink. Um, I'll say, you know, uh, not a lot of people have been talking about him, but he's been playing in a lot more situations. Uh, he's since Darby's gone down, he's been in there in those dime packages. Yep. And uh, you know, I think that he he's come in had the right attitude. He said that before the draft, he was watching video of Justin Simmons because he kind of tries to uh, put elements of his game into his own game. And uh, you know, people aren't really talking about him, but I wanted to just take a moment. I think that you know, it's hard being a rookie. It's hard being plugged into uh, Vic Fangio's defense here. It's hard knowing that you're behind uh, maybe the best duo in the NFL with Justin Simmons and Kareem Jackson, but he's really studied. He's been active, you know, uh, all these games, and he's getting playing time, comes up with his first interception. Uh, I think that's worth the cheers. Yeah, and we don't, we don't know what's next for the Broncos' safety position after this year. Obviously, Kareem's on the last year of his contract. We don't, but We don't know that. We don't know. But Caden Stearns makes me feel a lot better about the future. Yeah. Of that position. And, like, Jamar Johnson has also come in, and yep. uh, he's been an- inactive these first three weeks. But Caden Stearns has found his way onto the field, and uh, I think it's rare for Vic Fangio to put rookies out on the field just like this. And, you know, Pat Sertan obviously is Pat Sertan uh, uh, again. But I'm saying in defense. Oh, got it. And then Caden Stearns also getting some good run yep. here. So yep. uh, cheers to him. So uh, we are – we are broadcasting live here at Breckenridge Brewery's Farmhouse in Littleton, right off of Santa Fe. Every Monday, 6 to 7, we're out here. Uh, it's just a good time out here, you know. When the when the weather gets a little bit colder, we're going to go inside. But right now, when it's nice, we're outside and we're hanging out. The sun's going down. It's just a good time out here. We're enjoying it and breaking down Broncos wins. What could be better? Come out. Uh, it's every Monday from 6 to 7. If you don't live in the area, we're on the Broncos YouTube page live here. Uh, we got about six, seven minutes left in this show. And what a better way to, to wrap things up by talking about this Ravens game coming in, uh, uh, coming up on this Sunday. Eric, this should be a, a pretty entertaining game. They, they have an emotional win last week against the Lions. The week before that, another emotional win. Last second, uh, uh, beating the, the Chiefs, going for fourth down, and they get it. Um, the heartbreaker against the Raiders in week one, that crazy game on Monday Night Football. This is a pretty good team coming in. Yeah, it's a good team. They run the ball well. They throw the ball well. They play good defense. They're well coached. They've got a, a franchise quarterback. I mean, those are the things that make up a really good opponent. This is going to be. They've make, been hit by a lot of injuries. They have, especially yeah. at running back, which yeah. is, has been one of their strengths. Um, and they've got some guys on the COVID list right now. We'll have yep. to see how that develops. But, uh, Phil, this is by far the biggest test of the season so far. We talked about they took care of business 3-0, and but this is going to be a different sort of challenge. And so I'll be interested to see 
I'm really going to be watching it. We'll talk more about this Thursday during our other, our other show. But the first quarter, the first few series, do you come out and do you look crisp because you've essentially had three games where you can tune things up? Or do you get hit in the mouth a little bit because you're playing a different caliber of opponent? That, to me, is going to really decide sort of the tone of the game, the vibe of the game, um, is just those initial few series. Oh, most definitely, and especially for me on the defensive side of the ball, I just want to see if they uh, have come up with a game plan here where it makes it tough sledding for the Ravens because we've seen them do that against rookie quarterbacks. A little bit different facing Lamar Jackson. We heard Vic Fangio earlier today say that Lamar Jackson is like Barry Sanders playing quarterback. I mean, that is a scary – I mean, that's pretty scary. It's very scary. Yeah. And and they've had these last few weeks, Phil, essentially the fourth quarter off. You know, they've, they've had to play still, but – Justin been, Simmons' snap streak is – It's done, which he's glad about. He yeah. likes it. But you haven't had to play 60 minutes of, like, emotionally Intense. draining football where any play could change the game. This feels like one of those games where a big play here or there could determine who wins – You've got to be locked in. You've got to be focused. You can't let anything kind of slip here. And so that's that's going to be a new test for Denver because through the first three weeks, they played maybe a half of football, three quarters of football where it's been like really tense and the game has been on the line. But these fourth quarters have been smooth sailing. And so when there's four minutes left and you have to get a stop on defense, Justin Simmons said that's that's why it's been so big for us to do that here toward the end of games because you can't replicate that. When the offense needs a first down, when they've got a score, can they do it? It's going to be your first real indication. And I know that excitement for the team has been big here in the Mile High City. Broncos fans, very excited. But, like, say I wake up on this Monday and I'm like, oh, I wonder what Peter King had to say about the Broncos. Not much. Yeah. You know, I saw you mentioned Teddy Bridgewater briefly, but not much. Uh, you turn on ESPN, you don't really see much. Uh, NFL Network, not much. It's taking – It'll take something like a big win over the Ravens to finally get the attention of the rest of the NFL, get some national media really talking about this team. I know that uh, Teddy Bridgewater was uh, on the CBS pregame show, but I think that's more of Teddy being a really cool story. Uh, Four touchdowns, no interceptions uh, so far this season. The no interceptions really big, but if this team can come out and really take care of the Baltimore Ravens, then you're going to get some attention. And I think that uh, that's what's on the line this week. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone's kind of cautiously optimistic. You go, you've gone three and zero. You've won by double digits. You shut out the Jets. You look good, but there's still kind of this: can you do this against a quote unquote real team? And yep. if you do it this weekend, the hype train is just gonna Phil. It's gonna leave the station. You're the conductor, right? Is I that... mean, if they if the, if the Broncos win this weekend, we're just gonna shovel the coal in all there. aboard. Yeah. You know, Got it. Ben Swanson is going to be left behind if he doesn't get on there. We're going to be ready to go. I mean, this this has the the chance to just because it's not just a win. Like you would get to four and zero, you'd be in a really good position to make the playoffs because of how because of your start. But it also signifies we can beat teams that are contenders in the AFC. Right now, the train uh, maybe you can't see it. You can't see it. Maybe it's like platform and nine and three quarters, maybe. You can't. You can't oh, really see it. Yeah, you got to kind of run through like a little bit of a brick situation to maybe, maybe, get a really uh, believe. yeah, maybe beating the Ravens is like running through the brick. It would that... still be. I don't know if that's a great analogy, but we'll work yeah. on it. Because then, when you run through, you then you see the train and you can get yeah. on. Yeah. You know, but before that, you can't really. You can't you know, do so it. So we're wizards. Is that what you're saying? You're a wizard, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, obviously it's an exciting week around here just to be talking about a legitimate game, a big game with, with something on the line. You know, last point I'll make here is that the Broncos the last couple of years have played in some big games like last year against the Chiefs, you know, it's Sunday night football. But, like, nothing was really on the line. Now it feels like, hey, this is, this, you know, if you win this game, Phil, I yeah. don't think you go. I think you go from, hey, maybe this team should make, the, or maybe this team could go to the playoffs. To this team should make the playoffs. In the way the Chiefs have played, you know, yeah. already two losses. I think you say, hey, could this team challenge for a division title for the first time since 2015? I mean, it truly is that big of a game, just in terms of resetting expectations. I know you like DVOA. Yeah. You love DVOA. Yeah, you don't even know what Most, DVOA I, is. No, I have no idea. 
You know, I know what twenty six nothing means. I know what three and zero means. Yep. But DVOA apparently, according to you, says that the Broncos are one of the best teams in the NFL. Second in the NFL right now. Yeah. Who would you say is the best team in the NFL right now? DVOA says Cardinals. Yeah, but what do you say? I would say. I would still say the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, even though they just lost. I was going to say the LA Rams, probably. Yeah, I I still think, like if you had to, if you were like, who's going to win the Super Bowl? I still think having Tom Brady in the playoffs is. Um, yeah, you know. but my point was like, hey, the the Rams beat the yeah. the Buccaneers, yeah. and then now a lot now of people are saying about. they're the best team in the NFL. If the Broncos can beat the Ravens, they're going to get talked about here. Yeah, so. absolutely. All right, well, I think that's going to wrap up uh, this show. Any shout-outs? This is something we like to do. We like to do shout-outs. We haven't been doing them here at Breckenridge Brewery's Farmhouse in Littleton off of Santa Fe, Eric. But you got anything real quick here? Well, just shout-out to our uh, our fans who've been watching on YouTube. Love the questions. Thank you very ben much. Ben Swanson, Roya Burton, Liz Geralds, the crew. Yeah. Liz Geralds in the community doing a heck of a job. Got some events coming up this week, so make sure you uh, stay tuned for that. But, yeah, good to shout out Roya and Ben here making this possible. The sun is setting, so they're telling me we got to go. There's yeah. no more light. They can't even see us. Probably. There's no more light left in the day. Uh, Eric, you and me, we're going to go back to the facility and continue working. It's a big week. That's pretty much what we do, but Let's we'll be back. It. The next episode of the Neutral Zone comes out on Thursday. I've heard that. We'll be doing a lot more breakdown of this Ravens game. This one more of a recap type of show, but we'll really dive into the matchups coming up on Thursday. You can find the Neutral Zone on iTunes. iTunes, Spotify, Spotify Stitcher, Stitcher. TuneIn, YouTube. Pretty much everywhere. <laughs> I'm, I'm wrapping it up, okay? Not I'm, quickly enough. Sorry, yeah, gosh. Um, if you'd like to be a part of the show, you can smash the subscribe button on YouTube. That's nice. You can leave a, an email. Neutralzoneshow at gmail.com. You can leave a voicemail. 707 Neutral. And also, if you want a sticker. Email Ben Swanson. Yeah. <laughs> email Ben Swanson, yeah. <laughs> or just email the show, too. We'll get it. It doesn't matter where in the world. We sent them to Denmark. We sent them to Russia. You just tell me. You just tell me where you want it, and we'll send Phil it. Phil will get there. it there. It's a, it's a really a cool thing. So, All right. Until the Thursday show, uh, uh, that is going to do it for us. For Eric Dalala, I'm Phil Milani. You've been listening to The Neutral, the neutral Zone. Zone.